everybody, my name is Armand Zahur, and today I am going to be teaching you some stuff about classification of bacteria. Let's begin. So here's the objectives. We're going to be talking about bacterial shapes, gram stains, uh, gram positive versus gram negative, and then the bacterial family trees, okay? So there's two main shapes to bacteria. I mean, there's more. You know, like I mentioned down here, there's spiral sheets, there's filamentous, there's a bunch of shapes. But the two major ones you need to know about are cocci and bacilli. And bacilli are also known as rods, which is clearing it up because there's actually a species of bacteria called bacillus, which is not all rods, okay? So basically, there's cocci and there's rod-shaped. These are the two major shapes. There's also an in-between shape called coccobacilli. And these are kind of, you know, in a little bit in between. And the other shapes include this and this, but um, they're not as common, so I wouldn't worry about them too much for the sake of this lecture. All right, like you can see here, cocci, they can have different forms, diplococci, staphylococci, like a group of them, streptococci, like a string of them, etc. right? Let's begin. Gram stain. So gram stain is one of the many stains used for identifying bacteria. Bacteria are identified using a ton of different types of stain, right? However, gram stain is the most common and the most important stain we use for bacterial identification. It's the most important one. And the reason why is because it differentiates between gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So what are gram positive and gram negative? We'll get to that in the next slide. Uh, the differences between them occur because the cell wall structure is different between the two bacteria. Okay, and that's what makes all the difference. Some bacteria are actually resistant to gram stain. They, like gram stain doesn't work on them at all. And for those bacteria, they have their own special type of staining that we, we can come to at a different day. All right, like for example, tuberculosis, it has its own acid fast staining. Okay, so here is a gram negative and here is a gram positive bacterial's cell wall structure. Notice that in the gram positive, you have a cell membrane. They both have cell membranes and they both have cell walls, right? And the cell walls are made of peptidoglycan, but notice that the gram positive cell wall is much thicker much thicker and the gram negative cell wall is much thinner how does a gram negative bacteria compensate for this by having a second cell membrane which we call the outer membrane okay and this is what makes all the difference so why is this important gram positive is able to retain the stain in the thick cell wall which makes them appear purple gram negative cannot retain the stain in the th in the cell wall so it loses the stain and it appears pink i'll explain more on this next slide so this is like the full fixation. There's a bunch of processes. I just want you to remember crystal violet, iodine treatment, and counter stain. Okay? So gram negative and gram positive bacteria. You start the crystal violet, which is the purple stain. This is the initial purple stain, right? And you give iodine treatment to make it solidify in place. Afterwards, you wash the stain off, and then you use a counter stain, which is called safranin, which is pink. So gram positive bacteria do not get decolorized, right? Because their thick cell walls maintain the stain for a long time, the decolorization doesn't do anything, so they come out looking purple. Gram-negative bacteria, however, since their cell walls are very thin, they lose the stain easily. Thus, they become clear, and then they get uh, hit by the counter stain, which is pink. So gram-negative bacteria are pink, gram-positive bacteria are purple. This is the main difference. And if, if you want to memorize it, purple starts with P. Pink has the word N in it, so gram-negative is in pink, but purple doesn't have an N in it, right? That's how I remember it. So let's talk about rods versus cocci. So here is a general rule. It's not exactly true, but it's a general rule that makes it much easier to memorize. Most gram-positive bacteria are cocci, and there are some rods, okay? Most gram-negative are rods, and very few are actually cocci. All right. So if you have a gram positive, it's probably a coccus. If you have a gram negative, it's probably a rod shape. This is an absolute. There are gram negative cocci and there are gram positive rods, but you know, this is the general trend. Okay. There's other shapes as well, but those are rare enough that they're not worth talking about for this lecture. And uh, bacteria are cultured on agars and the agars differ, differ depending on the family. Okay, gram positive. Generally, we like to use blood agar for it. For and we'll see that soon. Gram negative, we have a variety of different agar types. Okay. So let's start with the gram positive family tree. Now I want you to pay attention along with me. We'll make this really easy. Okay. So let's begin. 
gram-positive bacteria have three distinct families, okay? Filamentous, rods, and cocci. For now, let's just talk about these two. I like to think of these as the cast-off families because these are just like, uh, whatever, whatever. Because the main big boys of gram-positive are the cocci, okay? So these ones are the filamentous and the rods. Remember what I said? Rods are rare and gram-positive. There's five ones that you need to know. And there's two filamentous ones. Filamentous means it kind of looks like a, you know, like a filaments, like a mushroom sort of shape where like the, the cells are just like long, elongated, like they have striations in them. That's filamentous shape. These are pretty rare. Okay. There's only actinomyces and nocardia. And I'll be honest with you, like these are super rare that I don't think it's worth really memorizing them deeply. Like they, they don't happen frequently at all. The rods, though, these are important to know because these, like bacillus, like clostridium, like QT bacterium even, these are common enough that you should know about them, okay? So there's a bunch of names here. So how are you going to remember them? Here's a little algorithm I made for you. Oh, wait. <laughs> okay, oopsies, forgot to turn off the animation. <laughs> so here is my animation for you. Notice I wrote down five things. A, B, C, C, D, L, N. Oh, wait, that's six things. <laughs> my bad. Oh wait, no, that's seven things. What am I saying? <laughs> My bad. Ooh, LN. Sounds like that talk show host, right? LN? Right. What do these represent? Here's what they represent. Each one represents a different bacterial species, okay? A is for actinomyces. B for bacillus. C for clostridia. C for QT bacterium. This is what causes acne, by the way. A clostridia, this is the... Thing that causes botulism toxin. D for diphtheria. Now the full name of the bacteria is Corynebacterium diphtheria, but I feel like the bacteria itself is well known by the diphtheria part, so I think you should memorize D for diphtheria, L for listeria, and A for actinomyces. Oh my god. <laughs> Little mistake. N for nocardia. Oopsies. My bad. Okay, ignore that actinomyces and for nocardia. So B, C, C, D, L are all red and A and N are blue. Why is that? Because the, the first and the last letter, A and N, are both filamentous. All right, so these are both filamentous. The rest of these are all rods, okay? This is the way I remember it. A, B, C, C, D, L, N. A and N are filamentous. B, C, C, D, D, L are all rods, okay? I hope that helps you out, like it helped me. So these, this is that family, right? Bacillus, Clostridium, QT bacterium, Corynebacterium, diphtheria, listeria, okay? Now let's get back to cocci. Now here are, is the major family tree that you should know about for gram-positive bacteria. So cocci can either be staphylococci or streptococci. Now, if you look through a microscope, sometimes you can tell. You can tell if it's Staphylococcus or Streptococcus, right? Like, Staphylococcus are in clusters, they're like grapes, clusters. Streptococci are like chains, right? But this isn't always reliable. Let's say a bacteria looked something like this that I'm drawing here. How do you know if this is one cluster of four bacteria, or if this is just one chain that happens to be going in a kind of square shape, right? That's not reliable. If you, so even though Staphylococcus and Streptococcus look different, that's not how we classify it scientifically. Classification-wise, you use the catalase test. And the catalase test shows that Staphylococci are all positive for catalase, Streptococci are all negative for catalase. Okay? Catalase is the enzyme that turns hydrogen sulfide into oxygen. So basically, when you put the, the catalase... Um, so when you pour hydrogen peroxide into the, the, the solutions, staphylococci will show bubbles forming. The bubbles are the oxygen bubbles. Streptococci will have nothing forming at all. It's just clear fluid. Okay, that's catalase test. Let's break this down a bit more. So we'll do staph first and strep later, okay? So staphylococci can be broken down further into coagul into sorry, into staphylococcus aureus or staphylococcus other species, which are epidermidus or saprophyticus. So how do you differentiate that? Coagulase test, right? So Staphylococcus, you start with catalase, all right? So you know it's Staphylococcus, and then you want to differentiate coagulase. Staph aureus, this is kind of like the final boss of many bacteria, to be honest, is coagulase positive. Staph epidermidis and saprophyticus are coagulase negative, okay? 
let's go down the tree a bit more. So it's like, how do you, how, what if you want to tell the difference between them? Well, you do a test called novobiosin. It's a type of antibiotic. Staph epidermidis is sensitive to the antibiotic, as in it gets killed by it, while Staph saprophyticus is resistant. It survives the antibiotic. This is the main difference. And how do I remember it? Think I like to think uh, Staph epidermidis, epidermis means skin, right? And Staph saprophyticus is typically, it, it causes UTIs in women. So I like to think of it as sensitive skin and resistant woman, like strong woman. That's the way I remember it. Okay? So this is basically all for staphylococci you need to know. And if we come down to streptococci, the family is a bit more complicated. But don't worry. Let's go through this one by one. So typically, hold on. Here's the catalyst coagulase test, by the way, I forgot to show you earlier. Negative is no clumps, positive shows clumps forming. All right. Uh, sorry, that's a coagulase test up there. Catalase test is this one. It shows bubbles forming. Right? This is a streptococci, this is staphylococci. Okay, makes sense. Now, blood agar is what we use to differentiate the different types of streptococci. And this is important because we have to talk about hemolysis patterns. All right. So beta hemolysis, alpha hemolysis, and gamma hemolysis. Beta hemolysis means it completely destroys the blood, okay? Uh, don't be fooled in thinking beta comes after alpha, so beta means mean partial. No, no, no. Beta means complete killing of the blood. It eats all of it. And when that happens, you see a clear pattern around the thing. So you look at this sample right here. The beta hemolysis uh, swipe, it's completely clear around it. So this completely hemolyzes the blood. Alpha hemolysis is partial hemolysis, so you'll see some greenish space, some hemolysis, but not complete. Okay, and gamma is no hemolysis at all. These usually grow in bile and not blood. So when you look at the thing here, it, it, there's pretty much no damage to the blood at all, and this is all blood agar, right? There's other bacteria that can also he hemolyze blood agar, by the way. Staph aureus, for example, remember I said final boss, it can be he beta hemolytic. Pseudomonas can produce pr blue and green colonies, right? But these, we don't use blood agar for them, it's just they can be uh, hemolyze blood agar, okay? So what do we see here? Beta hemolytic is the first family we're pointing at here. And it has two subcategories, strep pyogenes, strep A galactiae. Now, sometimes you'll see terms like group A strep and group B strep used in medicine, and this is what they refer to. Group A strep is strep pyogenes, group B strep is strep A galactiae. How do you tell the difference? Bacitracin. Beta hemolytic, bacitracin. Strep pyogenes is sensitive. Strep A galactiae is resistant. I like to think of the A as in like, like A, I don't, I don't give a crap, you know? I, I'm resistant, I don't care. Uh, strep A galactiae, right? Then we go down to alpha hemolytic. Alpha hemolytic also has two subcategories, mainly strep pneumo and viridens strep, okay? Viridens strep is like a wide family of strep. And how do, what's the test for it? Optochin. Strep viridens is resistant to optochin. Strep pneumonia is sensitive to optochin. And finally, gamma hemolytic. So I want to stress that beta hemolytic and alpha hemolytic are important to know. You really, you'll come across them in so many questions. Gamma hemolytic, I'll be honest, is not that common. It's not that important to know, but it's still good to know. Strep bovis, I've never seen this in my life, honestly, but just good to know. It grows in bile only. Enterococcus, you, this causes some UTIs and some GI infections. This grows in bile and sodium chloride. Okay? Are we good with this? Please, like, read over the tree again, because I honestly think this is the easier tree. Gram-negative tree is a bit harder than this. Okay? So this are gram-positive bacteria. Filamentous and rods form their own family. Remember what I told you? A, B, C, D, L, N. A and N are the filamentous. B, C, C, D, L are rods. Cocci are staphylococci and streptococci. How do you differentiate? Catalase test. Staphylococci, how do you differentiate? Coagulase test, right? Uh, so tells you staph aureus. Well, what about the other re re remaining ones? Novobiosin. And uh, what happens? Remember, sensitive skin and resistant woman. Okay. Streptococci, it's, it's a completely different system. It's not these enzyme stuff like we see in, st in staphylococci. Instead, it's he beta hemolysis. So Sorry, uh, uh, blood hemolysis, right? Beta hemolysis is a, think of this as the, the most powerful ones. This is, is strep pyogenes, strep galactiae. Alpha hemolysis, strep pneumo, strep viridens, gamma hemolytic, it's not very common, but it's good to, good to know, strep ovis, enterococcus. Let's move on to gram negative. Now, I consider this the harder family tree, but we have to learn it, okay? 
So there's so staph. So sorry, uh, gram positive bacteria have three families, right? Filamentous, rods, and cocci. Gram negative bacteria have four families. Okay. Now let's just start with the easiest one, the diplococci. Now these are the only cocci that are gram negative. All other gram negative are something else, either the cocobacilli or rods or whatever, right? But they're not they're not cocci. The only cocci are Neisseria, so a Neisseria family, by the way, which has two subspecies, and Moraxella. Moraxella is pretty rare, don't worry about it. But basically, how do you tell? You'd look for maltose fermentation. So if the, if the diplococca you see ferments maltose, it's Neisseria meningitidis. If it does not, it's Neisseria gonorrhea. It's the STD, you know about gonorrhea, right? That's it for diplococci. Cocobacilli. This one, you're just going to have to memorize these names. I liked it. Uh, so it's a lot of the things you might have heard of. Haemophilus influenza, Bordetella, Pasteurella, Brucella, Francisella. I like to think of it, the way I remember it, is Felis and his four sisters, Ellas. Okay? Haemophilus and then his sister, Bordetella, Brucella, uh, <laughs> Pasteurella, and Francisella. His four sisters are all named different variations of Ella, and his name is Felis. This is how I remember Cocobacilli. Okay? Rods. This is where it gets a bit complicated. So gram-negative rods have many different variations. The first test you do is to test for lactose fermentation. Does it form lactic acid or not? If it does form lactic acid, then you look at the speed of formation. Okay. So if it's a fast fermenter of, lactic, uh, of uh, lactose, it can either be Klebsiella, E. coli, or Enterobacter, the key family. If it's slow fermenting, it does ferment, but it's pretty slow. It can either be Citrobacter or Serratia. These, are, uh, honestly, if I were you, I wouldn't bother memorizing it. You don't see these names very commonly. These, though, you, you definitely see these names commonly. This one, not as common. Now, let's say it does not f f ferment lactose. It's a lactose non-fermenter, right? Now, uh, now, you have a test to do. You call it the oxidase test. If it does not ferment lactose and it's oxidase positive, pseudomonas. And this, remember what I said about Staph aureus being kind of like a final boss? This is like a final, final boss of bacteria. This is a very tough bacteria to deal with if you get an infection from it, okay? It's called pseudomonas, especially its subcategory called pseudomonas aeruginosa. We'll be talking about that next time. If it's oxidase negative and lactose fermenting negative, then you have to ask the question, does it produce hydrogen sulfide on TSI agar? Does it? Yes. Salmonella, Proteus. Proteus can be seen through other things like swarming, but Salmonella, you, you want to remember the hydrogen sulfide for that. This is very characteristic of it. It does not produce hydrogen sulfide, so it's negative for everything. Negative lactose, negative oxidase, negative hydrogen sulfide, Shigella, or Yersinia. Yersinia, by the way, pre Yersinia pestis is what actually caused the Black Plague that destroyed medieval Europe. All right, It's, it's kind of a trivial nowadays, but it's interesting to know that, that these bacteria still exist. Okay? I hope you're with me. I know this is complicated stuff, but trust me, if you read over this a few times, three or four times, really get wrap your head around it, it's not that bad. Okay? And the final family, so remember we said there's four families, diplococci, cocobacilli, rods, and the final one are curved rods. Okay? So these ones are, are like rods, but they kind of have their own unique shape. They're not always like straight, normal rods. And what you need to know is they're all oxidase positive. Remember the test we did here, oxidase positive for pseudomonas? All of these are oxidase positive, okay? And there's three that you need to know, and each one has a different distinguishing feature. Let's start with Campylobacter jejuni. This one is an important one. You'll need to know it. What's the distinguishing feature about it? It grows at 42 degrees Celsius. If you see a question on your exam with the number 42 on it, you know it's Campylobacter jejuni for agar. That's, that's the answer, okay? If it's alkaline media, it's vibrio cholera. So it grows, it doesn't grow in acidic media, it grows in alkaline media. That's vibrio cholera. It causes cholera disease. You might know about that, right? And finally, if does it produce urease? If it produces urease, it's helicobacter pylori. This is what causes, you know, a peptic ulcer disease, gastric ulcers, helicobacter pylori. So let's have a quick recap. Here is the gram positive family tree. You know, the whole families, three families, and the main hotshots are the cocci. Here are the gram-negative bacteria, where there's not really one main hotshot, but different variations of different types of gram-negative bacteria. And that is it for bacterial classification. <coughs> I hope you learned something today.
Thank you for your time.